Hey, welcome to Fusion. Thanks for being with us. Today we're so privileged to have some of our own young people leading us in worship and bringing us the word. And next Sunday, we're going to have Pastor Tom Flaherty from Madison, Wisconsin bringing us the word. He came last year and he's doing it again this year. So make sure you don't miss out. Be here next Sunday, June 17th to hear Pastor Tom Flaherty. This Tuesday evening, June 12th, we're having ladies meeting right here at Fusion at 7.30 p.m. Make sure you invite a friend. It's gonna be a good time. Here's something to mark on your calendar. On July 23rd through the 27th, there will be a performing arts kids camp from 8.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's for ages six and up, and there will be various interests available for the kids to partake in. If you'd like to participate in this event, or if you'd like to know more information about it, please contact Brendan or Asia McGlinchey at 653-9289. In case you weren't aware, we have Youth Night every single Thursday night at 7.30 p.m. It's for ages 14 and up. So if you're youth aged and you haven't been coming, you've been missing out. We hope to see you here this Thursday at 7.30 p.m. because the more people that are involved, the better it is. Thanks for joining us today. Enjoy the service. Today we're going to be starting off in uh, the book of Job 31. So if you could turn your Bibles there. Uh, today I'll be speaking on, on um, what uh, being compassionate looks like, how to walk with compassion. And so uh, Job has a really good, uh, kind of like a poetry, gets a little extreme. And we'll start from there. Verse 31, I mean verse 16. If I have denied the desires of the poor or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, but from my youth I reared them as a father would, and from my birth I guided the widow, if I have seen anyone perishing or lack of clothing or the needy without garments, and their hearts do not bless me for warming them with the fleece from my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in the court, then let my arm fall off my shoulder and let it be broken off at the joint, for I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of his splendor, I could not do such things. As you can see right from the start, he's a little bit extreme with his poetry. I don't know many people who would have their arm cut off for not having pity on the fatherless. But I think, I think you kind of get the point of what he's trying to bring across is that, is that he feels really pitiful for how he might have treated somebody that was needy or he might have not treated somebody kindly or, you know, different reasons of why. And so, um, and so I would just like to kind of challenge you with this question. How many times do we walk by the hurting without feeling pity or without feeling the need to give them anything? How many times do we walk by somebody hurting and don't feel compassion for them? When will we start looking past our own problems and start seeing the problems of other people? So oftentimes we get caught up in our own, own, own uh, kind of living of how we, of how we want, of, of our schedule, of our, of our way of doing things, and we start putting that up front before anything, like if we're kind of busy doing our stuff, and all of a sudden this person needs us, but we're like, but I gotta do this because I want to do that. All of a sudden you put yourself in front of another person, and all of a sudden you become more important than that other person. Um, and so, I would like um, our, our next place to turn. It could be is in um, Matthew 9, uh, 35. It's the next place, and we're going to see the example that Jesus set out for us. And I'm going to just read a couple of verses just to kind of show you the heart of Jesus. In Matthew 14, 14, he was saying, When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Matthew 15, 32 says, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. Jesus had compassion on them. No, Matthew 20, 35, 34, I mean. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. And so now the verse that we're going to be uh, seeing on, as you can see, Jesus was always walking in compassion. Wherever he went, he was compassionate for people. He really loved people. He just wanted, he just wanted the kind of the best for people. And so you should be in your Bibles in Matthew 9, 35. And there it talks about Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, 
proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. This is the part that really gets me. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Realize one thing, he doesn't say he had compassion on them because they were holy and righteous and they knew all the law and they did everything right. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. Isn't the heart of Jesus amazing? That he would love on those that are forgotten, the misfits and the outcasts. No matter where you come from and what background and what past you have, that Jesus still, that Jesus still moves with compassion for you. And you might be here today and you have a lot of stuff in your past or you might be helpless, you don't know what to do, or you're broken hearted, you might have gone through a major tragedy. I would just like to remind you one thing that no matter what, Jesus moves when something like that happens. When you're, it's something, it's, it's almost like God gets kind of excited for, you know, bad stuff to happen. Not, I don't say, I'm not saying he, li he likes bad stuff happening to you, but he just kind of moves whenever your heart gets broken because it breaks his own heart as well. And he just wants to, he just wants to pour his love and his compassion for you. And so you, you might be here not knowing what to do. Well, I, I have the answer. His name is Jesus. He can, he can just, if you just turn to him, he, he'll uh, be there for you. He'll, he'll um, fix the problem. He'll, he'll mend your heart back together. Um, but wouldn't it be nice to have the heart that Jesus had? Wouldn't it be great if we can love the unpopular like Jesus did? Um, oftentimes we, we want to uh, be kind of like the in crowd, they like to say, like be part of the cool kids, you know, part of the big shots. The, but but what, if, what if you saw when you're in your group of friends or whatever, you see somebody out just by the corner by themselves, and they are helpless, like it, like it says here. And you don't even, like your heart doesn't even move. Shouldn't that, shouldn't that, like, shouldn't you move towards that? Because that's how Jesus was. He, I mean, he had dumb fishermen following him. <laughs> he called them and he decided, hey, these guys, I want to be with them. And so he, he, his heart was for the brokenhearted. He never came, he said he never came for the righteous. He came for the sick because the sick need a doctor. Those who are already fixed, they don't really need that. And so, how about if our heart was like where we started reaching out? God's heart breaks whenever people are abused and misused. Shouldn't our hearts break as well? You see, this is what Job was talking about. Job had the heart of God. Job knew God so well that Job's heart became God's, and then Job felt sorrowful for all the people that were hurting. So... How do we get compassion? Well, first of all, you've got to look past yourself and start looking for opportunities to help others. You've got to get our minds off of ourselves and how to please us and start putting our minds on others and pleasing them. Jesus saw that, that the people were hurting because his focus was on them. If he had his focus on himself, he would have taken advantage of that opportunity to see how this would benefit himself. That's one of the problems I have with a lot of preachers nowadays. They start preaching. They even start, you know, they, they can heal people and they can do all these great miracles. But then that's all for money and fame they do it for. And that is, that's not going to get you into heaven. It won't because you're doing it for yourself. How to walk in compassion. I like if we could all turn to um, Philippians 2, uh, verse 1. Therefore, if, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. 
So how do you walk in compassion? By doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit is how you get it. Selfish ambition is useless. Your pride is useless. I'm sorry, but it's not. Like if you, if you start putting yourself in front of another person, there is going to be no eternal gain for that. Zero. And, and, um, and the Bible talks all about that, how, you, how you're going to get rewards in heaven. That's, yeah, it's, it's totally another message, but it's, it's really cool. Like, you should, you should have your focus on what's eternal and how this will affect the eternal. If you start doing stuff out of your own uh, pride and stuff like that, it's, it's, just stop right there. It, it won't get you anywhere. You're not going to please the Father because you don't want to risk your reputation by doing something nice for another person. God doesn't care for your built-up reputation because it was based upon yourself. Now, God is a God of glorifying himself. He wants everything to give glory. That's why we are created. We are created for relationship and to glorify God. And so once when we have anything in our life that glorifies ourselves, that's one thing that God just says, nope, want to take that out. That's what pride is. is that start, you start glorifying yourself. You start, you start um, doing what you like. And so, and so once when something opposes the glorification of God, then God is, of course, going to oppose that. Of course, God says that he opposes the pride, right? And so that is one of the reasons why, because, because he wants all the glory to himself. That is why he has the angels and the 10,000 upon 10,000 of people worshiping him. It's all, it's all part of that. Um, if it isn't glorifying God, then get it out. Why do you think God hates pride so much? Because the focus is on you and not on him. So then we get to our next question. How do we get rid of our selfish ambition? The answer is in, in the same verse. How to get rid of it is to start walking in humility by valuing others over yourself. That word value is a powerful word and is something we as humans always strive to get. We always start looking for the value in ourselves. You know, you, you've probably heard of, of speakers or you, lift to, or you listen to like uplifting music where you try to find value in yourself. You know, you want to feel valued. You want to be somebody, you want to, you want to accomplish stuff, you want to do all these amazing things. And so, but the Bible says that we're not supposed to, well, it is important to have value in ourselves because it's important to have security, and that's all something God gives us, it's not something we get for ourselves, we don't, we don't, we don't strive to get it ourselves. Um, we love feeling valuable, we like feeling like we have value. But it's really interesting that it says that we should value others more than we value ourselves. So where do we as Christians get value from? From God. So why then do we try to add our own value when God already has done that for us? The more we try to add value to ourselves, the more selfish we will become. The more stuff we start, start doing that, that makes us look good, and the more, more we start, our intent starts... Um, Starts, it starts focusing more on ourselves and how, okay, how will I benefit from this or how will I, how will I get something out of this instead of just simply, here, I want to I wanna serve you today or I want to just help you today and, and just simply give without even expecting anything to get back. So the more, more you try to value yourself, the more selfish you become and the more you value others over yourself, you become more like God. So which one would you rather want to be? Would you want to be godly or do you want to be worldly? Like, do you want to just satisfy yourself or do you want to satisfy God? I mean, in a sense, isn't that what God did for us? Isn't that the reason why Jesus came to die on the cross? That is the same way we're supposed to be. We have to crucify our own flesh, our own desire, and our own wants. And we have to put others in front of ourselves whenever we see, see somebody hurting and we don't feel like helping them. That is a really great indicator. You, you serve yourself over others. Once when you start basing your feelings or whatever that I don't really feel like helping them today because I'm tired and lazy and stubborn. And so... And so um, it would be, that's a, it's, once, once, when you, once when you feel that way, you should start thinking, okay, God, I need help in this area. I am 
not doing your will. I am only trying to serve myself, and uh, I really need you to help me exactly in this situation. And in the fourth verse, it was saying, do not look for your own interests, but look for the interests of others. Invest more time thinking of others and encouraging others rather than thinking of yourself and building your own self up. Um, it has to do a lot with your mind, what you think. You really have to control your mind. And you have to personally make that decision, okay, I, I have to start, start thinking, start just make it like practical even if you want. Um, Start, start thinking, okay, I'm thinking too, of myself too much. I'm thinking, oh, no, this is, this is going on here for me, this, this and that. And you start totally ignoring everybody else that might even need more help than you even need yourself. And so once when you start thinking of yourself more, then you start losing compassion for other people because you start being self-focused and you don't start giving love because you never give love, so you can't really get anything back because you're just keeping it in. And so I would like to uh, end off with Matthew 22, verse uh, 36 through 40. Well-known verse. I think it's a really good one. It says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's kind of true. I mean, if you look at the Ten Commandments, the first five are with your relationship with God. So it's, it talks about love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And then the other five commandments are your relationship with other people. And so, and so then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And so it was really cool to see that, that Jesus actually did line up with like Old Testament scripture and stuff. But isn't it, wouldn't it be, it's very hard to live a life where you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Because how many times do you wander off and start thinking of your own, own stuff and you start doing your own thing, you do, do what you like. And how much, and I think it really does affect our relationship with others because, because you become uh, inward, you become self-focused instead of others-focused. And so it's, I think it's really cool how, how that loving your neighbor as yourself and, and loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul kind of just ties together because once when you start doing that, then loving your neighbor as yourself automatically comes. And so I would like to encourage you with that word is to start walking in compassion. Uh, stop living for yourself. And I would also like to hand out an encouragement to those that might be feeling lost or broken and there's no other place to go. I would really just like to encourage you, find Jesus, get to know him. Yeah. He's the ultimate source of love and compassion. And so, yeah, just, just start walking in that. And I hope you guys are blessed. And our next speaker will be Jolene. All right, so this is part two of Kendrick's message. <laughs> All right, let's just pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for every person that's here in this place, and I just pray that um, your Holy Spirit will speak to their hearts, that you will um, speak through me to the people here, God, and that um, we will just know your heart more this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So good morning. Um, 
So I want to just start off with sharing a little bit about God's heart. And I know Kenrick was kind of talking about this already too, but that Jesus had a heart of compassion. Um, so, yeah, I just want to read a few verses that kind of show us what heart, God's heart is like. God's heart is a heart of love. Um, his heart is is good, and he has good plans for each of you guys. Like, his heart towards you is good. Um, I'm going to start off with reading 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9 through 10. So it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So God did not appoint us to wrath. His plan is for us to have salvation. His plan is for us to live in freedom and redemption. So I want to read John 10, verse 10, which you guys probably all know this one, but I'll read it anyway. All right, and it says, A thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So Jesus came to give us a life. He came to give us abundant life. So that's what his heart is towards us. That's God's heart towards each of you this morning. Um, and I'm going to read another one here. Also a very popular verse. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. And so during this time that God is speaking this to Israel, they were actually captive while he said this. And he says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So Israel was kind of in this constant, like all throughout the Old Testament, we see them um, straying from God and then being taken captive. But God was always waiting for them to come back. He was always waiting for them that once they repented, he would forgive them and he would heal them. So it says his thoughts are that he wants to give them peace. He wants to give them a future and a hope. And that's what his thoughts are towards all of you, that he's always waiting for us to repent, to come back to him, and he's waiting with open arms to receive you again. So his plans for you are good. He loves you. And he's called each of you. He really has. I know you guys have heard this, like, a big part of your life, but he really has a purpose for each person in this place. I'm going to read 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. And it says, well, I'm going to start at 8. Therefore, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So he called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. So each of you, like I was saying, has a special purpose for your life. Um, and God has created you all differently. You all have different personalities and you all have different gifts. So do not compare yourself with the person right next to you. Your life will not look like their life. And you are accountable to God of how you live the life that he has called you to. Um, the, I know you guys have heard the parable of the talents, but um, it talks about the master leaving, and he gave one of his servants five talents, and one he gave two, and one he gave one. And when he left, or when he came back, they um, gave a report of what they did with those talents. And um, each of them had, was accountable for what the talents that he had given them. They had all been given different talents, but they were accountable for what God had given them. Um, one of them can say, well, he was the one who had all the talents, so then, you know, I, you know, he probably could go and do something great, but me, I don't, I don't, I just got two of them, so I'm not really going to go do anything with them. Um, one of them did that, but 
um, we can't compare ourselves to the people around us, but to actually use what God has given us um, for his glory. Let me read 1 Corinthians 3, <laughs> 6 through 9. For we are, let me see, yeah, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So we're all working together, we're all working as one, but one watered and one planted. So they had different parts of this one um, uh, purpose. Like we're all part of the church. We've, we all have different parts to play, but we're all part of the body. Yeah. So I know even like in the Old Testament, the, you see like Moses' life and Abraham's life and all these different lives. God worked in amazing ways through their lives, but it was not at all the same way. It was all in different ways. And so God will do the same thing in us as well. Ultimately, our purpose is to know God intimately, to have a real deep relationship with him, and then to be a witness throughout the world, to actually go out and show people who God is and what he's done in our lives, and to actually be the hands and feet of God, kind of what Kendrick was talking about, to be, um, to be compassionate like how God was compassionate. So that's ultimately our purpose. Um, let me read Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, we also, okay, and this is um, just after Hebrews 11, so it's talking about how all these people walked by faith, how Moses walked by faith, and how Abraham walked by faith, and Noah built an ark by faith, and all these things. So after this, it's talking about, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, um, I find this interesting. I actually read uh, a book. It's called Not a Fan, and it's a really good book. Got a lot out of it, but... Um, I think I mentioned it in there that we often are waiting for the day when we get to heaven and we'll get to talk to Moses and Abraham and all these people. Like, how is it to actually go up on a mountain and hear God's voice and um, see his back and all these different things? Uh, we want to go and hear their stories. But sometimes I think they're going to be the ones waiting to talk to us. How is it to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you like every day, like you walked and, you know, his power was with you and you were constantly hearing his voice? Like, how is it to live life like that? And so I just think sometimes we don't think about it that way. We think that they kind of, you know, they're the heroes of faith, but we now have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, walking out life. And he's our helper, our comforter, and he will guide us into all truth. So then we go, so we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Um, on Tuesday, we were watching a video by John Bevere, and he was talking about giving up all your old boyfriends, not holding on to them. And um, he had a little video on there of a man who went on a date with his um, wife. And all of a sudden, these boyfriends start showing up. And he's wondering, what is going on? And she sees no problem with it whatsoever. I mean, she loves him the most. She spends the most of her time with him, but she still has these other guys. And um, sometimes I think we kind of do the same. Well, I'm giving most of me to God, but, you know, I still want to have all these other things beside as well. And you can't have both. God wants all of you, not only a part of you. He's passionately in love with you, and he does not want to share you. So are you willing to lay aside every weight and sin? Are you willing to lay aside unforgiveness or fear of man, your pride, your selfishness, like what Kenrick was talking about, your, any lies that you've been believing, 
greed or lust or fear, doubt, timidity, condemnation, insecurity, wanting to stay comfortable. Maybe you just really want to stay comfortable and you don't want to give that up. Maybe it could even be a job or a friend, a TV show. Like Sometimes it can even be a good thing, but are you putting it before God? Are you putting it above God? So it's something that's a daily decision. It's Normally it's not a one-time like, oh, wow, I lay it all down. Great, perfect. It's a daily um, putting God above everything else. Um, Jesus said to pick up our cross daily. That means dying to ourselves daily, every day making that choice. So it says, yes, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I was talking about this a little bit earlier, that we all have a purpose. We all have a race to run here um, on earth. Each of us has a purpose to accomplish while you're here, and it's um, sometimes I think we think like, oh yeah, like five years from now or ten years from now, that's like when I'll accomplish my purpose that was here. But it starts today. It doesn't start way down the road. Today, just make, make that um, choice to die to yourself and to really just live fully for God. And like I said, our purpose is to know Jesus intimately and to bring truth and healing and freedom to this broken world. So run your race with endurance. Um, I'm going to go back earlier. I was talking about 1 Timothy 1 um, and verse 9. It says, God has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. So we're running this race not by looking at our own strength or power or wisdom. It says we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So that's where our eyes are. Our eyes are fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So it's not by my might or by my power, but by his spirit that I'm actually able to run this race with endurance. So keep your eyes fixed on him. The one who started the good work in you will be faithful to complete it. So that's where we need to keep our focus. We need to keep our focus on Jesus. We can't put our focus on our neighbor <laughs> and start comparing our, our lives to his, his life or her life. And we can't either just be focused on our own strength and our own plans. We've got to keep our eyes on him. So he, um, let me continue to read in verse 2 there. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So he demonstrated how to endure the cross. I was talking about dying to yourself, picking up your cross daily. And he did it with the joy set before him, the joy of pleasing the Father, the joy of being seated with him, and the joy of having an intimate relationship with us. So I'm going to read a few quotes from Not a Fan. There was a lot of good ones, but... Here's a few. It said, following Jesus will interfere with your life. And when is the last time that following Jesus cost you something? And if following Jesus cost you everything, would it still be worth it? It's something to think about. (laughs) And uh, there's an... Another quote in there, it didn't come from that author, but he, um, the quote goes, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Sometimes we think, wow, it's a big sacrifice, like giving up my whole life. But really, it's not yours to keep. So you're no fool to give what you cannot keep to gain that which you can never lose. So Mark 8 verse 35 says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. Because I know um, there's also that parable that talks about the man who when he found this jewel, he sold everything that he had for this one thing because it was that precious to him. And I see that as being what this is, where we are willing to give up everything to put God first in our lives because he's worth that much to us. 
and serving him and building his kingdom here. So for the joy set before us, we lay down our lives, we give it all for the intimate relationship with the Father and building his kingdom here and spending eternity with him. It's a daily decision to put God above anything else, above everything else. So I just want to read this verse one more time. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. It says, Therefore we also, it says an encouragement, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So I just really want to encourage you guys with that as well, to just lay everything aside for God um, daily. I know it's, it's a process, and I think that it's our decision to put that aside and to put God first about everything else. It's not so much as in striving harder, okay, i got to go home and try harder, but it's in just dying to yourself and living fully for him. All right, let's just pray to close it off. Father, I thank you so much for your grace. I thank you for your heart towards each and every person in this place, that you love us and that your plans for us are good, God, um, to prosper us and not to harm us, God. You've um, appointed us to obtain salvation, to have salvation and freedom in you, and to have an intimate relationship with you. And I pray that each person in this place will have that intimate relationship with you. And Lord, if there's things that we're putting above you, things that we're putting before you, God, I ask that you will reveal those things to us and help us to lay that completely aside as we focus on you, God, as we um, yeah, put our focus on you. And we don't, we're choosing not to put our focus on the people around us and not on ourselves, but on you. And to just serve you with our whole lives, to put everything, um, to give you everything, to run this race with endurance, God, because life is short and we just want to serve you and we, we know that you deserve it all. And so I just pray for a strength and a grace over every person in this place that they will um, go home and just continue to seek you and know you and c continue to have a desire to serve you with everything that they are, God, and that they will just um, have that joy always before them, to that joy of knowing you and of seeing you pleased, God. And yes, I just pray a special blessing over them as they go from here. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for listening to this message. You can find more messages online at fusionbz.com.